Constructing your life is about much more than just building a bank account. Each week, join real estate entrepreneur and mindset coach Austin Linney as he interviews guests who are constructing their dream lives and impacting the world around them on a daily basis. If you're an entrepreneur or wanting to start a business, or you just want to hear motivating stories of how others have overcome the odds, you are in the right place. And now for your host, Austin Linney. Guys, welcome to Construct Your Life. This is Austin Linney. So happy to have my good buddy, uh, Mr. Nick in the house. How you doing, buddy? Doing well, doing well. Good. This guy right here, man, I actually met him at in Nashville, funny enough, even though we lived in the same <laughs> state. <laughs> I had heard about him. Uh, multifamily investor, left his 9-5, buying in LA and Austin, kind of everywhere. Um, just really great stuff. Buying in markets that people say can't be bought in, which I think is great. So, you know, why don't you kind of start us with your story? Uh, you were working at Volkswagen for a while. Um, kind of start us there and we'll go from there. Yeah, sure. So I started working in Volkswagen. Uh, I was in college, dropped out. I realized I didn't want to be an engineer and then wanted to find kind of what I wanted to do. And, and for some reason, went into being a technician uh, for too long. Kind of struggled in that for about 10 years. Um, and while doing that, you know, I, I realized, you know, I liked what I did and I was, I was good at what I did, but I got to a point where I, I kind of reached the max of what I was going to make. Right. I was a master technician. I was flagging this such and such hours and I tried management I tried other positions and I just realized that wasn't for me. And I had so much more that I could accomplish. And so that's when I started getting interest, more interested in investing. Uh, I wish I had started with real estate when I got interested, but instead I started with stocks. And I invested actually in Volkswagen. So if anybody remember, remembers Dieselgate, um, I bought like a month or two before that happened um, and wasn't able to sell that until 2019, I think. Um, yeah, I sold it to go into my, my first apartment deal. Um, but so that, that luckily that taught me a lesson early on that I wanted control, right? I, I want to have uh, control of the deal. I want to know what's happening. Uh, when you know, invest in stocks, you don't really have that, right? there's, there's a, a layer removed, um, which is good for some people. It just wasn't for me. And so that's when I started listening to podcasts, started listening to bigger pockets. Uh, and then from then on, you know, I went the traditional route, bought some single families, bought some, bought a duplex, bought a turnkey for some reason, uh, which I still own. Uh, and then realized this is great. I love real estate. How do I do this full time? How do I scale up? And that's when I started looking at, at multifamily and kind of, um, seeing how far I could grow it. And that transition was about uh, October 2018. And so from then, that's when I, I met my partner and we just kind of took off. So let's talk about the job first, because yeah. a lot of people would, are, would just, because we're taught that it's just comfortable to be in the job and you're scale, you're, hey, you're getting promotions, you're moving on. So you have, you have a family, like, you know, like it's scary out there, right? So what was the driving force? Because look, just from the outside in, you don't seem like the type of guy that's ready to go bungee jump. Like, so my question, <laughs> <laughs> you're very analytical. And I love that about you because you're very, you're very intentional with your, with your purpose. Mm -hmm. Did you have to have conversations with your wife or yourself kind of talking yourself into this avenue, this different, because you could have just stayed there and made good money. Yeah. Oh, definitely. It, it was something I, 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 I agonized over, I thought about, you know, what, because there is, the comfort is nice. You know, that, I think that's why people stay. Um, but I just, you know, it wasn't rewarding. It wasn't fulfilling. And I didn't want to, you know, luckily the first shop I worked in to go off on a small tangent, uh, had this, you know, amazing tech, but he had worked at that same shop for 50 years now. Mm. Um, and you know, I, I, that was like the warning for me. Right. Cause I, it was hard on your body. I didn't want to like, just do that. Like that was my life. Right. I don't, I don't want that to be my life. Like, Hey, you know, I worked a long time as a technician. I went home and then I died one day. Like I didn't want that to be my story. And so that's kind of what pushed me past that. And, and so many times in life, right. It's dude. It's so funny that you say that because I'm having a flashback in my head right now. There are people cause same thing, restaurant business for 20 years there are people in my life that, that presented themselves to me, meaning waiters that were 45 and 50 and they're smoking a pack of cigarettes a day, drinking Red Bull, <laughs> and he's hurt. 
and like, don't get me wrong. They're not, not making good money, but I just sure. looked at that as like, Oh my God, like I can never do that. And those are stark reminders in your life of what it can be. Right. And I always tell this story. Um, I had a neighbor when I moved to San Antonio that her dad is a great, he's a good guy. He's nothing wrong with him. But he's an older gentleman and he has nothing like nothing. And you know, that's what happened. I'm not saying corporate America is bad, but what I'm saying is that you are just technically a number. And what you said is you wanted to be in control. And that mm -hmm. is what, uh, you know, whatever vehicle you use, as long as you control it, real estate, you know, stocks, what, whatever, it doesn't matter. But, but that's an avenue that you searched for your family because that gave you time back to your, to your loved ones, to your wife and, and you're not killing yourself. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Good point. For sure. And so you branch out. A couple, <laughs> I love how you said, I don't know what I was doing with that turnkey, but, uh, <laughs> but, but so you bought some single families. I would imagine that it felt good. It didn't felt not bad, you know, like for lack of a better word, but I guess the, you once again get pushed up against the ceiling of limitation, right? Right. Yeah. I mean, the way I was doing it was, you know, saving up for the down payment, um, it was doing nothing even fancy with, with financing. It's like, you know, save up 20, 25%, uh, buying about one a year. And it was like, okay, this is going to take me forever. That was, that was the main impetus. I knew that there's, you know, I could still continue up, but it was very linear, right? Buying one, maybe I'd get to the point where I could buy two cash flow on those aren't huge. So it's not like, you know, that's, that snowball is growing, but just not at a rate I was happy with. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so when you started learning about multifamily, what were the avenues? What, what intrigued you about it in the first sense um, that kind of uh, flicked the light bulb off in your head? Yeah. I heard on bigger pockets, uh, this group of guys who were buying apartments. And at that point I had never even thought of it. I thought apartments were things like, you know, ultra wealthy companies buy. I didn't realize like, you know, you and I could be buying apartments. Um, so that was awesome when I heard that. I was like, okay, that's what I want to do. And that was like 2015. So I wish I would have jumped in then. Um, but then I convinced myself it was, it was still too much for me. I was very much, I'm going to do it all myself kind of guy. Uh, and looking at apartments and the price tag on them, I got a little bit of sticker shock. Uh, never working with investors, never working with partners. I was like, all right, I'll build up my single family until then. Um, but as the more I listened, the more I heard people, you know, uh, making it happen um, earlier and earlier on. And that's why, you know, I finally decided, all right, there's, there's gotta be something here. Uh -huh. And, uh, and then what was, what eventually got you off the, off the, the sidelines in the multifamily space? Sure. Um, I was looking at selling my first single family that I had bought. Uh, I bought in a nice section of Round Rock. I'd appreciate it really well, uh, completely by accident, right? I just got lucky. It wasn't something I planned out. Um, and I was looking to put that into more units. And I wasn't even sure if I wanted to be in Austin at the time. I still had that very much, you know, I'm going to do it all myself mentality. So I thought, okay, I have this chunk of change. Where can I buy the most units? And so I'm looking in like Ohio, right? Knowing nothing about Ohio. And the more and more I was like structuring out and looking at how to do this and make it happen. I'm like I got to go through all this work. I might get a deal a year. Like why not just try and do it in Austin? Mm -hmm. Right. And then I was like, all right, well, I need help. I need, I, I don't really know what I'm doing. And that's when I reached out to like a mentor to kind of get some guidance. And who was that? Uh, it was Jake and Gino. Jake and Gino. Yeah. And what did you, you know, a lot of people, you know, Gino said it on the podcast. I interviewed him today. You know, a lot of people look, especially younger people look at education as, as this is what I'm spending instead of this is what I'm investing. Mm -hmm. So, you know, what would you say that, that that avenue did for you that a lot of people, whether it be ego or whatever, doesn't doesn't go down that road? Yeah, um, I was uh, very much the same. You know, I was like, I'm not going to spend any money on anything. I can learn this all on the Internet for free. Right. And while that's true, you your learning curve, first of all, gets cut down because you're not having to, to scour it all and validate people's opinions and um, you know, there's a popular real estate forum. You can go on and ask a question and you're going to get 50 different answers from 75 different backgrounds. And most of them are unqualified, right? So they'd shorten down the learning curve, but then also, you know, the communities you get out of this and the networks you get out of this are invaluable, you know, and that's, I think, um, one of the biggest investments in it. You know, I met my partner that way. I met yeah. investors that way. That's how we were able to scale. 
And see, that's what people don't talk about enough, right? Is that, mm-hmm. and, and think what you want about Grant Cardone. It doesn't matter. I don't care. I'm not going to get into that whole thing. But, <laughs> but, but what he did say that I always thought that was interesting is you're going to the 10X conference thinking that you're paying to see the people on stage. He goes, no, 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 no. You pay for the VIP tickets because it's the people that you sit next to that you meet. That's the true currency, right? And I look at the event I went to to meet you. I mean, how many people I've met through that. I look at the event that I went to Arizona randomly, met like seven people I'm doing business with. You have to get out of your comfort zone. You have to do things that maybe you wouldn't think would be necessary. But more importantly, tell me if I'm wrong with this. You also have to have the mindset walking into it that you're going to meet somebody that's going to change your life. And that is mm-hmm. allowing the universe in order to throw that back on you too. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Because, you know, networking, and this might sound a little shallow, but it's a numbers game. You're going to talk to tons of people. Um, and, you know, you always try to offer value to people that you speak to, but some people you're never going to talk to again. And then some people you're going to do, you know, millions of dollars of deals with, but you don't know that unless you, you know, talk and, and put those repetitions in. Thousand percent. A lot of the guys, uh, a lot of the guys that listen to my show are newer guys. So let's walk through. Let's really get granular. What what Mr. Nick's good at. Let's get granular on the first deal. The first deal that came in multifamily. What was that? Um, yeah. So the true first deal uh, was a fifty-three unit in Austin. Okay. Price tag? Uh, it was about one hundred and twenty-ish a door. Okay. And so. There's no like holy crap going on when you're like, uh, <laughs> is that, oh, definitely, yeah, right. So yeah. so 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 walk us through that to tell us what happened. So you're like, oh my god, this might actually happen. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, at that point, I had already looked at a ton and offered on a ton, right? Um, much like networking, it's a numbers game. You know, if you want to find good deals, look at a ton of deals. Mm-hmm. Um, and so when it came time, you know, on that property, we just went through the process we had already done. We had toured it. We had underwritten it. We felt good about it. We offered a number that made sense to us. Uh, when it was kind of like an oh shit moment, uh, it was when they started coming back talking about our offer. I'm like, oh, okay, crap, we might actually have it here, you know. Um, and that was uh, that was intense. I've never really negotiated uh, much before, and that's one skill that I, I was severely lacking at the time, and I'm still working on now. Um, but it was uh, an interesting experience. Um, Luckily, I had my partner there, um, and that's why I stress, you know, having somebody who's done this before um, on your side helps a ton. You know, he's 20 years experience, um, made a lot of the questions and, and concerns I was having, you know, had answers for, which is helpful. Yeah, I mean, that's, I just did the math. That's 6.36 million. <laughs> yeah. uh, just a little step up from single families. <laughs> just a, yeah, just, just a little a touch. bit. But, you know, if we can get, if we can get, like, about the, about the moment. But also, at the end of the day, there had to be been a back-end confidence level on the foundation and the viability of Austin as a market in general, right? Oh, definitely. Yeah, that's, I mean, uh, we, we didn't really touch on why I invest in Austin when I was looking at a state, but that was one of the things I realized. is like, hey, this is one of the best markets, right? People want to be in Austin. They just think it's too competitive. So if I can find a way to make Austin work, like think of how beneficial that would be. And that's something that I've always mentioned to you is that it cracks me up when everybody's like, Oh, just don't look in Austin. And yet you're, yeah. making, you're making your hay in Austin. Right. Yeah. Well, when I started, that's all I heard was like, Oh, you know, I was trying to find people. I was trying to find people who invested in Austin to ask, you know, what, how are you doing this? How are you making it work? And everybody's like, Oh, don't invest in Austin. Go to Dallas, go to San Antonio, go to Houston. And I, I, it, it took forever until I actually found somebody who invested in Austin. And I thought, you know, maybe, that's the opportunity, right? Everybody, it's kind of like a rule of thumb. It doesn't make sense. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Thousand percent. So, so you, <laughs> I, I, I haven't been there. So you finally, this, they finally agree to a price, right? And yeah. you're like, oh, it's done. And no, it's not done. But you're like, holy crap! Like we have to figure out how we're going to execute this. So, kind of walk us through after they said, oh, we'll take that offer. What what was the next step? Yeah, we made our offer uh, very aggressive on the terms. Um, and I think we did a 17 day due diligence. Uh, and that was the biggest mistake I've made. Uh, because, you know, this is the first one in Austin. You know, we had, we were still scouting our property management team. We didn't have our inspection company ready to go. So those 17 days were some of the most like 
hair pulling stressful days of my life. Cause you're still getting all these processes set up. Mm-hmm. Um, but luckily we pulled it together. I'll, I'll, I said, I'll never do that again. And then we did it on the next deal, but it was much easier because we had all this, the people lined up already. Um, but, uh, yeah, going through due diligence, that was fun. Um, negotiating, you know, on a few things we found. Um, and then, you know, just, uh, the amount of work that goes in, the amount of emails that go back and forth is like truly amazing, especially when it comes, you know, with the lender and, um, more so than a normal, you know, single family closing, or at least in my experience, although the lending experience was a lot, a lot easier, I would say. That's, that's what people don't understand. The multifamily lending is easier than the single family. That's what they don't get. Um, that being said, it's still, mm-hmm. it's still all complicated. So, so you go through, oh, yeah. you go through due diligence, everything happens, you close, right? You close yeah. the deal, you, whatever you sign. What is the feeling when you're like, holy crap, like we just did that, like for real, for real. And now we have yeah. 53 <laughs> separate humans that we have to deal with. Yeah, it was, uh, it, it took a while for it to be real to me. Right. I think it was probably like a month into it. I was like, Oh my gosh, I like, I actually own this complex. Right. Cause before it's just like, you're doing the motions, you're, you're doing the work. Um, and it's, there's a, I guess a little bit of a, a disconnect. And then when you start seeing like monthly reports roll in and you're making decisions about renovations, you're like, oh, okay, this just got a lot more real. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it was, it was awesome. It was a great feeling, especially after, you know, making all those offers and going after all those deals we did before. It was nice to finally close one. And you're still working your job at this time or no? Yes. Yeah. I work my job, um, till right after we closed our second property and we're on contract on our third. So you got done the deal that nobody ever thinks possible. The first multifamily and you didn't go 15. You didn't go 20. You said you fuck it. We'll just go 53. (laughs) What, what through the process, if you just had to highlight real quick, what was easier than you thought and what was harder than you thought? Um, yeah, easier than I thought was going back and forth with the lenders. Um, especially when they did came time for their appraisal and their, their reports, I thought they were going to tear it apart. Um, that was relatively painless. Um, harder was the due diligence and getting everything lined up. You know, most of my background at that point was all single family. So I was like, yeah, call this inspection company. They'll come out to inspect it. You know, I mean, I knew we were going to have to do financial and stuff like that. So we had that covered, but um, getting the, the physical inspections and lining up your contractors to make sure, you know, go through all your walkthroughs. That was a lot more complicated on a short, on a short time span. And so, I mean, you know, from the outside looking in 53 units, bro, you can just retire, right? You don't ever have to work again. Right. Ever. <laughs> I'm being yeah. Being yeah. Yeah. No, I wish that'd be awesome. But, but, be what boring, saying, but. <laughs> but what I'm saying is that what people don't talk about enough in real estate is momentum. Right. And you just said it. It's not until we got the second one almost closed and we had the third one in contract. So let's, I mean, let's go to that second one. How much farther after the first one was the second one? How big was it? Yeah, actually uh, 71 units uh, in Austin. Um, While we were closing on the first one, um, we were looking for a second one because, you know, the one thing about having a 53 unit property is it's not really, it's going to be very payroll burdened if you just have that one property. So the first thing we did was start looking around it for another property where we could, you know, share some payroll and get some economies of scale. Um, And we found this one that was brought to us um, by an uh, off market by a broker. And, uh, you know, actually the, the, the process of getting under contract was kind of convoluted, but we finally got it done. Um, And we closed, so we closed the 53 unit in August. um, I think August 1st. And then the other one uh, closed in October. Wow. Okay. So, so right on the right on the back end of it. So like, so like, you're like 121 units, like boom, right there. And um, and yeah. then what was the third one? Yeah. So while we're closing on the second one, uh, my partner and I are like, all right, you know, we just we we closed two really quickly in Austin. Let's take a step back and just kind of get these all settled in, um, and then you know, like a week later, this property came across our desk and we're like, Oh, this is awesome. This is exactly what we're looking for. Right. Mom and pop owner, 
out of state, owned it for 25 years, um, not charging rubs, rents, you know, way below market, 1980s asset in a good location in Austin. It's like, all right, you know, we have to try for this one. Um, and, and won it, you know, and we're like, oh, okay, crap. <laughs> this one? Now, uh, that one was just 62 units. 62 units. Okay. Yeah. Wow. So we're, we're almost at one thir- 183 in probably yeah. what, a four month span? Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, about uh, as far as closings go. Yes. And, and just so I'm clear and everybody understands if I'm, if I know the story, this is not a syndication. These are funded by y'all, right? Yeah. Yeah. This was just us. My so, partner uh, was 1031 in some stuff. So, so, I mean, guys, you know, I would love the problem to have would be to, to find, you know, to, for apartment complexes to be falling out of the sky and what they showed, right. And this is what people don't talk about enough. What they showed is they could close. And when you show you can close, you will be brought other deals. And so there's a lot of people talking out there, but when you have a track record and you show by your results, you know, those deals tend to fall in your lap and whether it be woo woo universe or whether it be you showed that you could do it. I think all that matters in the big scheme of things. Um, and I think it's something that people don't talk about enough. Mm-hmm. So, so you, yeah. you close the three, you're up to 180, whatever. And then you get the property management company on them. You're, 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 they're handling everything. You're doing some improvements, um, stuff like that. And then where do we go from there? Yeah. Um, so from there, I mean, we were still kind of in acquisition mode at that point. I had quit my job, um, to focus on this full time. And I also, hopped on to help my partner um, handle some of the the load back on his portfolio in Los Angeles. I want to stop right um, there. I want to stop right there because I know the feeling and I want to ask you, what was the feeling like walking away from the W2? Yeah, it was weird. It was <laughs> weird. Uh, you know, it's almost been a, a full year now and it's, it's so strange. I was thinking about the other day, like I haven't picked up a wrench in a year, right? And that's, you know, what I used to spend my whole day doing. So it's, it's nice. It's nice. It's, it's not no work. Definitely not no work. It's a ton of work. <laughs> I don't want people to underestimate, but it's, you know, it's, it's much more fulfilling. For sure. Because it's, yeah. because it's on your terms. And so yeah. that's all that matters. So, okay. My head's spinning. So 181, 183 units, you've only been gone from your job from a year. Where are we at currently on the unit count right now? Yeah. So personally I have, um, just over 200. Um, and we were actually, you know, coming into to February, had a 90 unit under contract in Austin. Um, we decided to, to put the brakes on that when, when COVID started happening, because we didn't really know, you know, what was happening. Um, and then right now, you know, we're, we're still looking for deals. It's just, we're being incredibly picky right now. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, you know, because I guess me and you haven't talked about this too much and I want to make sure that we get, the most value on the podcast because I know mm-hmm. you're a reader, right? And you're a networker. Yeah. What would you say on the personal development side? Because, you know, you're not like, you know, this about yourself. Like you're <laughs> me and you are very different people. You're, you're not, you're, you're, you're a great networker, but you're not blabbing your mouth everywhere. You're not on social media a lot. You're an executor and you, and you go and do what you say you're going to do. What would you equate to how you've, kind of constructed, I guess, for lack of a better word, this mindset that allows you to keep pushing forward on these deals when a lot, a lot of people maybe back out or, or would be impatient and and buy bad deals. Yeah. Um, I think it was enough for me to, to know that it worked and to know, you know, joining that, that community helped a ton because it was like, I joined at the same time with a bunch of other people. Um, we're kind of in like this mastermind and seeing their success. It was like, okay, like it not only is it motivating for me, but it's like, I know their origin. I know where, you know, where they started. We didn't start from that diverse of a background. Um, if they can do it, I can do it. Right. So it's just more of like a persevere and put the time in, um, and it'll work. And I'm, you know, unfortunately after almost 11 years as a technician, I fully understand like you're, you're successful by doing the work. Right. And so it was just finding the right work to do, I guess. I think the thing, and I think you would agree with this too, probably the same context. I think what changed for me 
was when I met some of these guys that I looked up to. Maybe they were on Bigger Pockets. Maybe they're in Go Abundance. What G, you know, Jake and Gino, whatever you want to call it. And I realized whether they said it to my face or I just realized it is they go, Hey, you're not that different than me. And that's when I was yeah. like, Oh, okay. They just got started a little before me. That's all. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I was, I, I tried to network with a bunch of people from bigger pockets in Austin. And that was one thing I, I noticed when I was meeting them. It's like, you hear them on podcast. You're like, wow. They're like, I'm going to meet this like Titan of a person and not that they're bad people, but it's like, you start having a conversation like, oh, you're a regular person, right? You have different ideals and different mindsets, but you're not, you know, some mythic, fi- uh, you know, figure. No, agree. So what I want to spend the last couple minutes on the podcast, we'll, we'll go to a new investor. Let's say a single family investor or somebody that hasn't even got started yet. Let's mm-hmm. walk them through. If you just had three to five t- topics that, that you would focus on that would get the most out of you and you're not just flailing around, um, yeah. kind of like lock in on how to, how, how to execute. Sure. Um, I think the first thing you should do, and this was one thing that helped me a lot was kind of take a, a self audit, you know, where are you in your career? Where are you with your finances? And like, what's your network like already? Right. Because when I started investing, um, I had money saved up, but it's not like I had this strong network of, of people to, to pull funds from, right? I was a technician. Most people wouldn't even talk to me about investing or real estate. Um, and also my time, my time was extremely limited. So for me to be looking at out of state markets and picture myself flying there and looking at deals, it wasn't realistic for where I was. Right. So I kind of had to focus on Austin. Um, so I think when you're, when you're starting out and you're trying to look for like a market and what you can bring to the deal, um, I think kind of taking that self audit and see, you know, maybe I'm, in a high paying career, I know a lot of people with high net worth, I might be able to bring more of like a fundraising aspect. I really love, you know, if you really love networking and have, you know, like I said, a strong network. Um, If you're more on like the operations side, you're very analytical, you can offer a lot of value that way. Um, So that'd be my first thing, take a step back, do that audit and kind of see where your strengths are playing out. Um, And once you've kind of used that to help choose your market, right? I mean, there's, everybody knows, you know, there's, three big things you want to focus on on a market, right? Job growth, population growth, um, and barriers to entry. At least those are the three that we look at, right? You want people moving there, you want jobs moving there, and you don't want it to be um, oversupplied out of control. Um, From that point, you know, it's choose, put your blinders on, especially when you're starting out, because you don't want to be like, hey, I'm going to invest in this market, but I'm also going to do this over here, and I'm going to do this over here, and go, you know, 17 different directions and make no progress in one. Um, and that's what I did is like, put my blinders on. I'm going to buy in Austin. I'm going to buy in Austin. Like, Oh, here's a deal in San Antonio. Not, not interested. I'm going to buy in Austin. Right. Um, and then start meeting people in that market, start networking with people, reach out on bigger pockets, go to meetups, just start building your peer group. Because when this becomes, you know, the normal thing for you to do, it makes doing it much easier. Right. When it's like something interesting and weird and nobody, nobody, you know, does it. It's all kind of, it's hard to like keep that momentum going. But when you're talking to people and they're like, hey, you know, like I do this exact same thing too. I was looking at deals all last week and I was underwriting. I was working on this and such and such. When it becomes the normal, you know, it's a lot easier to keep that momentum going. I think, uh, yeah, those would be my, my, my big three, I guess. I love it. And, and I think what I, and you'll love this because I, I I told Gino this and I wanted his comments on it because I, I was in California and I was running. And I don't know why I thought of it. I think I just interviewed Adrian and uh, he was talking about Dave Tupin or whatever. And I was just thinking about these young kids, right. That I meet that are like 21, 22, and they've got like 60 units, a hundred or 300 units. And I'm just like, you know why they've got those many units? Cause they just don't know any better <laughs> because like <laughs> yeah. lack of knowledge almost helps them because they have no context to the situation. Right. Mm-hmm. And then they wake up at 27 and they're like, Oh, I'm retired. Like, yeah, if you want something, meaning if you want it and Nick wants freedom to spend time with his family and go to Colorado and go on vacation, if you want something, there is nothing that will stand in your way, regardless of lack of knowledge, resources, whatever. It doesn't matter because what I love about real estate, right? And you, you probably ran into them from time to time. 
guys, there are people out there that have 10,000 units and you've never heard their name. They don't speak. Mm -hmm. They don't talk. They're not on social media. These guys just execute. And I think a lot in life, we get caught up with the flash and we get caught up with the sizzle. And I just had Terry Judge on, who's my, one of my favorite people in the world. And we talked for, you know, 30 minutes about cost as a creation. It ain't sexy, but that's how you get wealthy, baby. And people don't understand that insurance, you know, tax code, cost segregation, property management companies are how the big boys make money. And everybody is so quick to post the deal they do on Instagram or so on and so on. It's funny that you said the knowledge got you to where you go. It wasn't until I sold my first property that I was like, oh, you did it. Not only did you do it, you executed it from start to finish. You found the deal. It took nine months to buy. You bought it right. You put the money in. You didn't have the money. You found the money. You executed Airbnb. You sold it for a huge profit. Holy shit, you might actually know what you're talking about. It wasn't until that happened, right, that you're like, oh. And, and so what is the daunting task is that first property but once you knock that domino down, mm-hmm. whether it be a mobile home park, an RV park, a single family, multifamily, that is the confidence that you need in order to execute. That's it. Right? Yeah. Wouldn't, wouldn't you agree? Definitely. Yeah. I mean, once it's, it's a lot of, you know, when somebody says it's possible, uh, that helps. Um, seeing other people do it, that definitely helps. But the moment you do it, it becomes so much more real. And it's at that point, it's just like riding a bike, right? Like, you, nobody really thinks like this is impossible when you hop on a bike once you've done it. But when you're trying to learn how to do it, you're falling down. You don't like it. You know, but it's like you get going, you get momentum, you learn how to do it. And the next time you pick it up, it's not anything unique. I mean, it's, it's fun. You enjoy it, but it's not like relearning every time. And, and what would you say if you had to put your hand on like two or three books that really helped you get to where you're going, what would those books be? Oh yeah. Um, super cliche, uh, thinking grow rich. Um, but that was, you know, actually back it up how to win friends and influence people. Um, that was the first like self-help, uh, self-development book that I read and really like just changed the way I was thinking. Right. And I, and from there, um, I transitioned that to Think and Grow Rich. That was the next one I read. So those two combined were just like, ah, like opening my eyes to so many possibilities. Um, and then from there, there's a ton that I've read. The one that I love to recommend to people is Shoe Dog, uh, the Phil Knight story, how he, you know, the creation of Nike. That is a fantastic story. And it really tells like the real side of like being an entrepreneur and, and, and starting these businesses and how, how the struggle is and what, you know, people see the success, but they don't see the action steps. And so I think like, seeing that background and all the struggle they went through, it puts what you're going through in another perspective. Cause you're like, Oh, this is normal. This is par for the course. Like it's good that I'm here because that's where everybody started. That's where everybody's, what everybody's going through. Thousand percent. And yeah, those, those, you know, those books, it's funny. <laughs> I laugh cause you know, how to win friends. That's like the Bible, right? I didn't read it till like three months yeah. ago. And I realized, Oh really? I really like, I've been doing this my whole life. And I didn't even know this book, but, (laughs) but it really is a foundation for everything. Right. And it's, it's, it's so Mm -hmm. much more And and the reason I love Nick guys, and I'll just say it out front. He is an amazing human, like whatever, dude, like the real congrats. You got 200 units. I don't care. Like you're, you're a badass person who's cool. And we like to, we have a good lunch when we hang out and everything like that. And we, we know a lot of the same people this is why I brought him on the, the story on the real estate is amazing. But what we're trying to show up for every day is who we are as people. And th- these books that he's talking about is the foundation for how we treat people around us, our family and business, right? These are, these are foundational structure mm-hmm. to how you treat your employees, your, your, your boss, yourself, your, your family. <coughs> and it allows you to have a basically a group a blueprint for life is, is what we're after um to to mm-hmm. execute and so if you had to say um you know we don't know what everything that's going on in the world but if you had to say like what is your like what is the holy crap goal like if you want to share it or don't like how many units do you want to get to 
where are you trying to go? Like, where do you see yourself in the next couple of years? Yeah. Um, next couple of years, it's I, my biggest goal. Um, not my biggest goal, but one of the biggest goals I had was transition from my W2. Um, and so once I hit that, it was like, okay, let's see how far we can take this. Um, in the back of my mind, is I've always had this like very uh, egotistical goal, but I, I like it. Um, where I wanted to, you know, have a net worth of 620 million by the time I'm 45. Cause okay. I wanted to be above where Buffett was at that age. <laughs> um, cause he's one of the people I read about and looked up to. And, uh, I, um, you know, I thought that'd be, that'd be awesome to achieve that. But at this point, really it's, it's how do I build what started off as, you know, me transitioning by W2 into like this full fledged investment business mm-hmm. and, and just growing that. No, I love it, man. And I, I appreciate your time. I know you're busy. Um, it's been a while. We haven't seen each other. Uh, I promise I'll make it to Austin soon or you come to Arizona. But if they want to uh, <laughs> tell them about your amazing podcast that you have and tell them about ways they can get a hold of you or, or stuff like that. Yeah, definitely. Um, so the podcast, it's the Wild West Real Estate Show with my partner, Mark. Um, he started it basically to highlight these strategies of people investing in these really competitive markets, uh, global 24 hour cities, you know, Austin, but also like Los Angeles, San Francisco, uh, because you hear a lot of the time you can't invest there, but those are some of the best markets for exponential growth. Right. So it's a, it's an awesome podcast that highlights those strategies that you don't hear about. Um, and then the best way to, to reach out to us and learn more about us is just quantum capital Inc.com Q U A N T U M. Uh, capital inc.com uh, and to reach out to me it's just nick n-i-c-k at quantum capital inc.com that's the best way to reach me is email and if you have any multifamilies in austin or la he'd love them and you can partner with them <laughs> yeah definitely reach out <laughs> yeah, yeah i love it man hey dude i appreciate your time my brother thank you so much man if y'all enjoyed this podcast make sure you share it send it to your friends and i really appreciate it bud Yeah, thanks for having me on. You got it. Thank you for listening to Construct Your Life with Austin Lenny. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to rate, review, subscribe, and pay it forward by sharing with a friend. Most importantly, take this opportunity to start constructing your life by taking immediate action on what you learned. For show notes, resources, and more information on -on one-on-one coaching with Austin, visit constructyourlifepodcast.com.